there is nothing like the exuberance of a bush picnic race. We're encountering one this afternoon here at Gregory Downs. Horse races, foot races, beauty parades, the bookies are out in force. It's going to be a fun, fun afternoon. We're up on the Gulf of Carpentaria in Berkshire for what is the big annual event. Already in the last episode, we experienced Berkshire's wide range of features. It's morning glory cloud formations that come in in spring. Giant cattle stations like Gregory Downs and Floraville. Indigenous hunting with Aboriginal elder Murrundu. The Aboriginal totem poles out on the salt flats of the Gulf. The new passport program. And the bubbling hot waters of the Great Artesian Basin. In this episode, fashion fun and foot races at the Gregory Races. Hell's Gate reveals its heavenly side. Paddling the Gregory River in an annual classic. Fishing the rivers leading into the Gulf of Carpentaria. And all the passion and pandemonium of Gregory's annual bush dance. All ahead in this episode of Travel Oz. Hello, welcome. I'm Greg Granger. There's a real buzz in the air at the Gregory Racetrack. Punters have been looking forward to this event for a long time and their excitement is palpable. It's all go, you're the MC, it's all go this afternoon. It is all go here this afternoon, absolutely. Gregory Downs have obviously just opened this brand new facility, upgrading the facilities due to COVID last year, they couldn't open. So this is the year, hence why we're expecting such a big crowd. People have come here from all over Australia. I've spoken to people that have travelled from Adelaide. We have someone here from Phillip Island. So people are really embracing that events are back on and people want to support events in regional Queensland. What's on this afternoon's program? So this afternoon we have six races, six local races, which is amazing. We've got fashions of the field for kids up to adults. I'm always excited to come along to a race meet. I feel like it's just such a great boost for the economy in small towns. And I think it just helps put places like Gregory on the map. Born on. Bet with the strength. Bet with the bulky. Pre-race, the first horses are being paraded. Just eight jockeys will ride all today's runners. Good team of horses I'm seeing here. Yeah. Good fleet of uh, jockeys. Yep, we had a good roll up. We had eight jockeys, so that's, that's a good number for us. Good number. Of course, those eight jockeys, they're going to be racing almost every race, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they won't get many breaks. In the stalls. And they're off racing, just as horses here have raced for more than a century. All eyes are on the track. The putters are up feet. This is their biggest mass celebration since before COVID restrictions kicked in. Across the line and the winning putters are jubilant. Watching the horses race is one thing, but these annual race days in a small settlement like Gregory are much more than horses. What about fashion? Kelly Stevenson is rallying the crowds for a series of fashion parades. First the kids. Then the men. The women. And the couples. Much merriment all round. And a gift basket for the winners. But there's an even bigger event to cap the day off the Calcutta auction. We also have what's called a Calcutta, where people can get involved to actually run themselves. We auction them off, and a percentage of that is actually donated to the Royal Flying Doctor Service as well. All very worthwhile. Absolutely worthwhile. 150, 150, any harder, 150, none of it. Gotta make a bid, gotta join in here. Four hundred, 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 four hundred
These runners are then directed to the same stalls where the horses start. They're going to race from the stalls along the horse track. Men first. Then the women. All good fun in the annual Gregory Race Meeting. Days in see some lively evening entertainment in the form of a bush dance. Here's where the ringers get to release a year's worth of pent up emotion from all that bull wrangling. Let the classics ring out as Gregory's annual race meeting comes to an upbeat conclusion. Remember the day I set you free. I told you you could always count on me. Baby, that ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you, baby. Yeah, the Gregory Day. We're on Highway 1, a road that runs right around Australia. And surprise, surprise, up here, the road is still dirt. We're on the border with the Northern Territory, in a place that's been given the unholy name of Hell's Gate. Amidst the giant boulders that line the road, I recall just why it's been given this God-forbidden name. In the very early days of white settlement here in the Gulf, travellers from eastern Queensland would come through here on foot, on horseback, droving. They'd be escorted, escorted by police. The police would make sure they were safe to this point, but no more. This was the farewell point. They had to travel all the way through to Catherine in the Northern Territory. Bye bye, take care, you're on your own. Because this was named the Gates of Hell, Hell's Gate. So what exactly is here these days at Hell's Gate? Here's a couple who may tell me. The owners of Hell's Gate, John and Jenny Hayes. It was a goat track, you know. We came through here 29 years ago and it was, it was just bulldust from here to the border. You could get through, but just. Our neighbours came here, I think it was 40 something years ago. They drove through here, couldn't get out to Westmoreland. They drove a tractor out with his wife, new wife, so it took him two days. John and Jenny are running two distinctly different businesses here. A cattle property and a roadhouse. They feel an obligation to keep the roadhouse running as a service to passing motorists that both are all consuming. So you've bought not just a roadhouse at Hell's Gate, you've bought a big cattle property. Well, well it's not big in terms of some of the places around here, but yes, yeah, 422,000 acres. And Sounds big to me. Yeah. And you're running, what, 6,000 head of cattle? Well, not yet. We'll run that. 6,000 breeders, 7,000 breeders, but we're at this stage about three running around here. With a name like Hell's Gate, John and Jenny are playing up the theme. Check out the signs on the lavatories. And what about the drink cooler? It's a coffin. One of the features here is the water hole, fed by the waters of the Great Artesian Basin and a big draw card for birds. Getting to Hellsgate no longer has to be on foot. Most travellers arrive by car or van. But make sure you refuel. It's 320 k's to the next petrol station. And prices are off the clock, $2 a litre. For some, flying into the Hell's Gate International Airport is another option. For John and Jenny Hayes, their humble roadhouse is indeed a heavenly stopper. A lot of people come through the gates there, where, where the Hell's Gate originated from, and the name, and then they get here and see all the green grass and they said, I don't understand why it's called Hell's Gate when they see when, when they get here. Because it's true. It's not hell really at all. It's no, quite no. A slice of nice heaven here, but yeah, it's lovely. But the name is the gimmick. The name gets people in. Well, it does. And if you stay here tonight, you probably want to stay forever, mate. So it's one of those things. So. Hell's Gate. I made it. 
<laughs> I made it. Should I stay in hell? Hell's gate. It's not that bad, mate, is it? <laughs> Fishing is big in Burktown, and there's no bigger fisherman than Johnny Yanner, better known by his initials JY. We're heading out today with Johnny on the Albert River. Now, he's a man who was born under a tree and lived all his life here. He says there's big crocodiles all around us, but no worry, he and they have an agreement. No, I don't have any problem with them. Well, I got an uh, agreement with them. They leave me alone and I leave them alone. So they know not to come near me. I suppose they could use me for a toothpick if they really wanted to. Johnny has a tongue-in-cheek solution if he were to be attacked. And when he opened his mouth, just stick your arm straight down his throat and grab him by the tail, turn him inside out. First on Johnny's agenda is to catch some bait. Now that means stepping onto the muddy banks of the Albert River, but not to fear. Hopefully the giant salties will remember their agreement. Out goes the net time and time again, and in they come. Potty mullet. Perfect bait for the fish waiting to be snagged. Then in go the lines, and almost straight away, the head has been bitten off the bait, probably by a shark. Next throw, Johnny actually does catch a shark. In it comes, in it comes, and then bango! <laughs> off it goes. Well, I think he bit us off, by the looks of it. He's only a little fella, there'll be some bigger fellas out there. Oh, yeah. These are rich fishing grounds, as Johnny proves with his next cast. There's a strike almost straight away. In waters teeming with barramundi, today he's snagged a blue salmon. First catch of the day calls for some photos. All this fishing, we've worked up an appetite. Johnny's going to cook his catch the indigenous way. I'm sure he's quick to build a raging fire, and onto the ashes goes the salmon. Then a bed of mangrove leaves serves as a plate. 30 minutes out of the water and it's ready to eat. Caught and cooked in record time. Life doesn't get any better. Any better, no. <laughs> Paradise. Paradise. The hot, dry savannah just to the south of Birdshire is known the world over for its abundant deposits of fossils. We're at Riversley, arguably one of the richest fossil sites in the world. Now this here once was the bottom, the bottom of a lake and all around us it's eroded, eroded right down here, exposing tens of thousands of fossils. Any wonder it's been World Heritage listed. Paleontologists around the world have been dazzled by the finds here. Amazing fossils preserved in the most exquisite detail. Among those working on those finds is fossil lab technician Alan Rackham. This is D site, one of the 230 sites that we have. There are millions of tonnes of tertiary limestone full of bones, and this was once the bottom of a freshwater lake. A huge amount of erosion has occurred, and with that erosion, fossils have been exposed. Yes. D site is one of the most important sites at Riversley, full of bones and fossils. Alan shows me a life-size depiction of one such find, a giant bird known as Dromonithida. It was the largest bird in the world, four metres tall, and only found here in Australia. Today, Alan shows me a rock carrying fossilised bones of one of these birds. What we have here, that's his lower limb bone. These are his toe bones. That's his gizzard. He had to be alive. He's walked into shallow water. He's got bogged. He's struggled to get out. He's completely buried himself. 
And when he's died and decomposed, the mud has just kept moving in and held him all together. That is a very special fossil. Elsewhere here in Riversley, I'm guided to more amazing fossil finds by Rod Lomo. Now, how's this? We've got a perfectly preserved turtle shell. Shell, yep. This is a, a, the shell of a, a turtle. It was about a metre wide. It had a metre shell on it. And uh, the weird thing about this, this, this creature, it had horns in his head like a cow. <laughs> Over here, we've got a clock, crocodile skull. Have a look. There's his nose bone there. Yeah. There's a tooth there. Yeah. There's another tooth there. Big teeth. Oh, yeah. And there's some cavities coming down the skull. When you see the head, it's only about one-tenth of the, the size of the crocodile. So there you're looking at about a ten-foot croc. Close to Riversley is the Bujamata National Park with the scenic Lawn Hill Gorge. We visited here in the last episode, but today Rod Lomo wants to show me yet more features. Well, Rod, quite stunning up here on the Lawn Hill National Park. We've got this deep red sandstone and then the beautiful water and blue skies. Yes, mate, this, this would be one of Australia's icons. You know, here we have this water coming out of this uh, basin up here that flows all year round. You know, endless supply of water through here. All this, the, the, the palm trees right throughout here, the bendanus, the different species of trees and, and, and plants, it's all an attraction to water, which we have here an abundance of it. The moment we arrived here, we saw this one hell of a big saltwater, freshwater crocodile. Freshwater crocodile, yeah, freshwater crocodile. We've got no salties in this area. Yeah. You'll only see them if they want you to see them. And uh, they're quite harmless. They're natural food of live fish. Now, a wonderful way for us to explore this is by canoe. We can come right up through these gorges. Canoe is the way you get the feel of it. Well, when you're paddling through the gorge and have these big red sandstone walls coming right up against you like that green and the beauty of it, it's just another world again. But, you know, to see the different species of plants and, and uh, different types of, of plants as you go through the gorge, just hanging, just clinging to rock. Well, certainly I'm enjoying this paddle today. We're able to come right up to the, uh, to the face of one of these cascades. This has got a name? Yeah, this is the Indari Falls. And this, this whole Indari Falls it's about a two metre high waterfall and you'll see all the different falls cascading of course into the middle gorge. So a wonderful place to go swimming right up against the cascade. Oh, natural spa. Get underneath these waterfalls and have them on top of you. It's just spectacular. There's something else again. There's an abundance of beautiful flowers around Lawn Hill. Red Beach Grevillea, Wattle, and a native hibiscus known as Desert Rope. What have we got here, Rod? Here we have the fruit of the emu apple tree. With a red rosy little apple that's on there. Edible? It is, mate, but gee, that we eat it there like that now. Oh, God, it's sour. Plenty of termite mounds here as well. <laughs> Rod, how tall? Why do the termites? Tell me why the termites build towers as tall as these ones. This, this uh, mound is actually uh, like a, an air conditioning unit. Like inside there, there's regulated temperature and a regulated humidity. Now these little termites need that to survive. Another waterway closer to the Gulf is the site of a true Aussie paddling classic. Today, we're watching as paddlers assemble for an event tied to the horse race meeting we attended earlier, an event called Saddles and Paddles. The paddlers are gathered on the banks of the Gregory River with Alison Whitehead, the starter. How's it looking this year, Alison? Uh, numbers are fantastic, Greg. The um, Northwest Canoe Club have been running the Gregory River Canoe Marathon for 46 years now. Now this is an interesting river because it's not a big white water river, but there's still some tricky parts. There certainly are. We have a couple of um, areas that are classed as grade two rapids, so uh, there is a tiny little bit that most people get stuck because there's some really long lagoons out there and they have to do a lot of paddling, more than they expect. Paddlers have come from all over Australia. The majority are from Queensland, so plenty from Atherton and the Tablelands. The sunny coast has always bring a strong contingent and uh, I think they're race favourites this year. Um, Mount Isa's going to miss out on bragging rights. 
two courses to be paddled down the Gregory today, a long course and a shorter one. Both with sharp corners that mean many paddlers will get a dunking. The long course is 42 kilometres and the short course is 18 kilometres um, and it starts from checkpoint three. Well, for both contenders, it's going to be a good experience, a good challenge. Yes, it certainly is. Look, it's a lovely day out here. Um, the water's going to be perfect. It'll be nice to go for a swim, I'm sure. One particularly tricky corner is known as Kenny's Crossing. So this is a natural spring-fed river that comes all the way from about 100 kilometres from here, comes up out of the ground. It comes through absolutely beautiful country and, uh, and there's uh, twisting and turning, there's trees, there's, uh, it's shallow in places, it's deep in places. We have five kilometre lagoons. Honestly, we, you know, we class it as an iconic race in Australia. There's probably three iconic races in Australia, one the Murray, one the Avon and definitely the Gregory. It's on everybody's, uh, everybody's bucket list. We've well, only got competitors coming through behind it and going over. Further downstream, the short course contenders are in the water. Beautifully scenic long stretches to enjoy, and then fast flowing stretches. Logs and branches provide obstacles that challenge many. Early afternoon sees the first paddlers reach the finish line. And first over, the fastest of the short course contenders. It's John Van Wright from Mariba. How was it, John? Yeah, it's a great race as usual, uh, Greg. A lot of competitors. I just did the short race this year. Um, which is a lot of fun. It's just 17 k's. It's my 35th race, so I've done a fair few of them. How old are you now? I'm 54. That's pretty good for a 54-year-old. I see a lot of old fellas and old girls on this race. No, it's a great sport. You can sort of keep doing this you know, well into your late 60s, 70s. Next in, Ross Johnston. How was it? Uh, great fun, great fun. It's just an awesome course. It's such, it's so beautiful up there and so much fun just to pick your way through it all. You've come in second and uh, there were a lot of obstacles that I saw, but you've got through without going over? No, I had a couple of fall-ins along the way. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be so much fun if you didn't have a few fall-ins. Almost 70 and yet you're uh, taking part in this event like you're a young man. Yeah, well, that's what, that's what paddling does for you. It takes years off your age. <laughs> but it's Ross's wife, Jenny, who sums up the high emotions of this event. I came to the top of the rapid and, and I had a little panic and then I thought, no, don't panic, you've got to get it. So I had my boat, I started to come down towards it and then just out of reach all the time and then my boat got caught up and swung around in an eddy and then I had to pull my way back up the rapids with my paddle. My steering had come off. So I flipped the pad boat over, put the steering back on and got in and I was fine. Yes! <laughs> the Gregory River Canoe Marathon, an Aussie paddling classic. Our time in Berkshire is coming to an end. Out on the endless salt flats bordering the Gulf of Carpentaria, there's time to reflect on the special qualities of this place. This to me is one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's ever changing. If you can walk here, you can walk 30 kilometers to the sea in our dry season. And in the wet, this is an inland sea. It is an absolutely spectacular part of the world. It is quiet and peaceful and you live so close to nature that you actually just feel part of it. Certainly the locals of Berkshire share a deep affection for this, their home. I've been in Berktown for 14 years. I love the place, the people and the community. Hi, we're the Marshall sisters and we love Berktown because of the lifestyle. Beautiful place to be, yes, a lovely area and yeah, we've made this our home and um, yeah, no turning back. For many locals, like Aboriginal actor Alec Dumaji, Berkshire has been in their family for a long, long time. Alec, what's your connection with Berktown? Ah, well, i got a long history here. My grandmother, who was an old Gungalita woman, was from the Barramundi Dreaming out here in a place called Gunamulla. And in the 1930s, she came here. Um, they brought her here, the missionaries, because she was, a, I guess, a savage, they like to call her. But she came here, and this, this is where my grandmother, um, in the early 1930s through until the 40s, lived. 
For the indigenous locals, traditions shaped over thousands of years are deeply ingrained and practiced to this day. As for the forces of nature here, the springtime arrival of the awesome morning glory clouds is a phenomenon experienced in few other places. A wonder of nature, like so much else here, that sets Berkshire apart. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time in Berkshire. Sadly, that is the end of this episode. But in our next episode of Travel Oz, we're travelling south all over the southern parts of outback Queensland. In the meantime, I'm Greg Granger. Happy travels.